right, looking at this piece of paper, uh, we said this is page 55. This is page 55. We are hitting the hardest part of geometry. It's called proofs. I need you to keep the mindset of what you did on the last school day. I don't remember if it was a Thursday or Friday. Was it Friday? Okay. I need you to remember the UNO game from Friday when I was giving you the cards and I said you had to start with this card, pass through the cards in your hand, and end on this other card, right? And you had a thought process. Remember that? There was a strategic thought process. It was in a linear fashion, meaning you went from one to the next to the next to the next. Um, then today's warm-up was also a thought process. I gave you a multi-step equation, you had to solve it, and you had to justify your moves by saying either, you know, addition, subtraction, uh, distributive property. We are doing proofs today, and they will revolve around proving two triangles are congruent. We've already covered triangle congruence. How many shortcuts are there? There's five, right? Um, SSS, SAS, ASA, AAS, and then HL. So before we can dive right into proving triangles are congruent in a two-column proof, we've got to cover a couple of the reasons that are going to come up. So in a two-column proof, there's what's called the statements, and then there's the reasons. It's just like a warm-up where we were doing the math, and then we were coming over next to it and saying because of addition, because of subtraction. So this sheet is giving you the majority, not all, but the majority of the reasons that you'll pick from. You with me? Okay, let's start by getting off our phone and then look up here. Um, a proof is basically a justification for something that you know. Can y'all see that? What's that green? Let me change it. You need to fill in your blanks. Fill in your blanks. Please fill in your missing... Guys, everybody, at the top of your paper, there is a gigantic line that completes the sentence that is in black at the top of this oh, screen. Oh, we're supposed to be right. A proof is a justification for something you know is true. Think back to like a courtroom. If you're having to prove something, you have to have evidence. You can't just come in there and say, well, I know it's true or not true. You have to have evidence. Um, so, for example, look at this right here, the shape. And what shape is it? Prove it. All are equal sides. How do you know they're equal? They look equal just lost your case. It's alright. Prove it. This is too hard. It's two parallel sides. A square. That, that's a quadrilateral square. You can't switch it, Rick. Isaac, say your statement. That's a quadrilateral. Justin, say your statement. You can't prove that it's a square. You can't prove that it's a rectangle. However, you can prove that there are, without a doubt, four sides there. There's one, two, three, four. There are four sides. So what is this shape called? Equilateral. Quadrilateral. Equilateral. Okay, I think y'all need to come off the couch if y'all are Quadrilateral means four-sided polygon, and equilateral is a three-sided polygon. It's a triangle where all the sides are equal. 
totally different. All right, so let's take some notes on your paper. This is a <coughs> quadrilateral. We're going to make a note in parentheses, a four-sided polygon. And then we're going to also make a note. The reason we can call it this is we have no info about side lengths. I'm going to put slash angle measures. We know nothing about it. We know what it looks like, right? We know what it looks like, but we don't know for a fact beyond a reasonable doubt that the corners are 90 degrees each. We don't know for a fact beyond a reasonable doubt that all four sides measure the exact same length. We don't know for a fact beyond a reasonable doubt that opposite sides are parallel. Get the picture? You can't go off of what looks like. You have to be able to prove it have to go off of what you absolutely know. Now go to the next two questions. This comes right off of the warm-up. Look at number one. Number one says prove that if x minus 8 equals 2 then x must be 10. I want you to draw a line to show where we're going to do this two ways. What's one method to prove that x must be 10? So that would be proving by solving it. So if I move the 8 over, right, what property would I be using to justify that move? The addition property. So when I move the 8 over, I get 10. We're just going to make a note with a little arrow that we did addition. This needs to be on your paper. If I'm writing, you're writing. Okay, there is a second technique for proving it. What? What's the math word for that? Instead of plug it in. Starts with an S. Substitution. So a second technique would be Plug 10 in, substitute it in, right? 10 minus 8 is 2. The right-hand side is 2. So therefore, it does prove it. What was your justification? It was substitution. Okay, go to number 2. I want you to use two techniques to prove that x is 4 in number 2. Two techniques to prove that x is 4 in number 2. Okay, what's one technique? Okay, so the first technique is solve it. What would you do first? You move the 5 over by subtraction, right? Then what? So we're just going to write a note right here. Subtraction and division. Okay, what's the second technique? And what's the fancy? Thank you. So the second technique is substitution. And you end up with 13 equals 13. We did substitution, so we've just proven it. 
right? Okay, so we're going to start with the um, properties that you've already been using. You've already been telling me the answers. You did it in the warm-up. You did it just now. But now we're going to put it on paper, okay? Um, these properties you learned somewhere in like 6th or 7th grade. When you first look at it, you're probably going to be confused. Um, and then I'm going to explain it to you. So the first property of equality is the addition property is the addition property of quality. Um, you did this in the warm-up and you did it in one of the examples, uh, the first one. Basically, it's saying if you have an equation, right, and you need to move something by addition to the other side, then you're allowed to do that as long as whatever you add on one side, you what? You have to add that same value to the other side. If you do that, you will maintain the equality between the two sides, okay? Here's what it looks like in fancy letters. If A equals B, then I can add some value C to both sides and it will stay equal to each other. This is called the addition property of equality. All it means is if you have an equation and you need to add something to the left, just make sure you also add it to the right, and you will stay in good graces of um, the algebraic rules. What do you think subtraction property of equality says? Exactly. It's the same concept. It's just if you need to subtract something from one side, you can subtract it from the other side and stay within the rules of algebra. You've been using this this whole time, you just never knew there was a fancy label to it. Okay. So anytime you need to move something by subtraction from one side to the other, it's by the subtraction property of equality. But you don't have to memorize the property of equality verbiage. Just know that if you subtracted from both sides, you should be able to tell me, oh, I subtracted. You know what I mean? You should just be able to vocalize that part. All right, what do you think multiplication? What do you think the then part's going to be on multiplication? Oh, it's going to be on division. No, multiplication first. It's the same thing we were just doing. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, yeah, read yeah, it. Yeah, what do you think yeah, it's yeah, going to yeah, say? Yeah. Yeah. That if if you have an equation and then you've got you know some c value, you can multiply that c on both sides and you're good to go. I am recording. So guys, let's do it. Same, same exact thing. You can divide both sides by what letter? C. We need to make one small little catch. What is the one thing in math you're not allowed to divide by? Zero. You can't divide by zero. So we do have a little extra here to say, hey, by the way, this is the extra part. By the way, C can't be the number zero, but then everything else follows. So this is the, the new part right here is just to say, hey, C is not the number zero, but then the rest of it stays in place.
Okay, then substitution looks a little different. It's saying, hey, if you've got x equals y, then you could substitute x in for y anywhere in an equation. We have a test Thursday. Check to that. I just want to have to do this. Check the Wait. Are you checking out Wednesday? Or are you not coming at all? I mean, I don't know. Is the test coming? Like, this stuff's on it. So, I don't know. Don't forget, talk to me again tomorrow. Yeah, it's going to be terrible. You're not going to study over the break. Yeah, well. Okay, go to the next uh, part on your worksheet. You have this. Chart right here, right? Yeah, it's good. Uh, they go off the I'll take it to the Is it going to be in the last one? Going to the line? Can you turn Go Guardian on? Yeah. Yes, you can, but no, I'm not all right, we have this chart right here. These are the three most common reasons that I'm going to be testing you over. So it's really important that you understand when to use these reasons, okay? The first reason is called reflexive. All right, I'm going to open that, and you need to copy that down. It's when any figure is congruent to itself. Oh, yeah, two boxes. Not three. Oh, no. No, I don't know. No, um, what you just ignore, so. Just take your paper. It's not bad. Take your paper. Uh, here's where the words are, right? You've got, like, the words. And then you have that. Okay, so I want you to write the definitions in this column and then come to that, that one right there and just split it right down the middle. Uh, split it right down the middle. Yeah. Okay. All right. So coming back over here. So write that definition in that first column. Now let me show you what it looks like. Let me show you what it looks like um, when it's a segment. So here's what it looks like as a segment. It's when you would say AB is congruent to AB. That's by the reflexive property. You're saying that side AB is the same length as, wait for it, side AB. You might be like, wait a minute, isn't that redundant? Isn't that repetitive? Like, why do I need to say that AB is equal to AB? Clearly it's equal because it's the same two letters, right? Go back to those examples where we had, don't draw this. Oh, uh, you could draw it. Okay. Go back to those examples where we had um, like that. You remember that? And we said what's not marked that should be marked, and it would be the shared side right here. And we talked about how if we take and pull them apart, that shared side gets written twice. Remember that? Okay, so if I said, what is your reason for, for marking this shared side congruent to itself? 
your answer would be it's the reflexive property. Okay? So I do actually want you to draw that somewhere um, underneath where you can where you can remember that example. Now here's what it looks like in terms of angle congruence. Kind of sounds silly. It's where you would say angle A is congruent to angle A. I know you're probably thinking, once again, that's repetitive. Of course angle A is equal to angle A. Alright, now I'm going to show you an example to draw. And this is not going to come up until after spring break. But I'm going ahead and I'm planning the seed for it right now. Because um, we're going to come back and I'm going to say, hey, remember this that day? So how many triangles do you see right here? Two, one, 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 one. It's like another temperature. There's two triangles here. You have a small triangle embedded within a big triangle. Oh. Uh, see it now? Yeah. yeah. Ignore the four-sided shape that's on the right. Ignore that. Focus on triangles. You have a small triangle that is embedded within the corner of a bigger triangle. If I took the small triangle and I pulled, imagine a tile, like on top of another. If I pulled the small tile away, right? So you don't have to draw this. If I pulled the small tile away, would this be my resulting Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I pulled, if I imagine if I could pick this up and then slide it out from on top of that bigger triangle, this is what I would have, right? What do you notice they both have? Angle A. They have angle A, both of them do. So when I say angle A is equal to angle A, it's because they share angle A. With me? Alright, guys, my job really stinks. If you're not paying attention, like it. So if you pay attention, please. Because I'm telling you, it will turn you loose to try this, and you're going to be like, I have no clue what to do. And I'm going to say, Ha! I told you so! <laughs> right? No, I wouldn't do that. But. Alright, go to the next one, symmetric. Here's the definition. Oh, that's long. By the way, the word congruent, you don't have to write the word, you could just do the symbol. And then that would shorten what you have to write. If two figures are congruent, you can write them backwards. Is the like watered down definition for the symmetric property of equality of congruence. Alright, here's what it looks like if we're talking about segments. For instance, segment AB is congruent to segment BA. What happened to the letters? They switched order. Now you might be thinking, when would that be necessary? I want you to draw this example wherever you have room. So when they were the same order, it came from this example up here. Shared side. Okay, it's still a shared side. Now, this is going to feel weird to draw it. Maybe draw a rhomb. Look at that. Change colors. Maybe draw a rhomb. <laughs> draw a rhombus as best as you can. Nope. Alright, let's try this. Draw a line right down the middle. Okay, then draw at the top, draw to the left, and at the bottom, draw to the right. So it kind of looks like a Z, a weird Z. And then now you're going to connect. Okay. So if I threw these two, if I threw this picture at you right here, um, I would say you need to mark what's not marked. And what would you go in and mark? There's a shared side. You would say, hey, that's congruent to itself. And then I would say, how do you know? And you would say symmetric. Here's how you can tell the difference between the two. Um, I'm going to draw this bigger so that you can actually wrap your mind around what we're doing. All right. Okay. 
So I'm going to call this A, B, C, D. We're going to um, say that this was a right angle, this was a right angle, um, and this is congruent to this. Okay, and then you would come in here and you would say, hey, that's a shared side. That's congruent to itself. And I'd be like, great, you're correct. What's your reason? Watch this. This triangle right here, is already positioned nice and like, I guess you could say upright. This triangle up here is upside down. So I want you to imagine me taking that and spinning it so that it's also upright. You with me? Okay, follow the route. So this A would land here. Do you agree? Okay, and this B is the right angle, so this would be here. And then the third part of that triangle would be here. Look at the side that was shared. Look at the side that was shared. Let me make my marks that I haven't made yet. That was congruent and that was congruent. All right. What do you notice about the side that was shared in green? But what about the letters? They're switched. They're switched. Do you notice that? Notice here it was B, C, if I read it from top to bottom. Over here, if I read it from top to bottom, it's C, B. This is symmetric property, okay? So now, come back to this. How are you going to distinguish reflexive properties and symmetric properties? Because they're very similar. The difference is symmetric switches the letters, right? Here's how you remember it. Go to this example here. Ask yourself, if I reflect the left side to the right side, does the shape line up and match? I'm going to ask it again. If I reflect the left side to the right side, does it match? Yes. Then the answer would be reflexive property. Come to this one. If I reflect the left side to the right side, does it match? No. That tells you it's not reflexive because it can't reflect, it's symmetric. So that's how you tell the difference between the two. Okay? Okay, so this, let's make a note, will reflect this switches. Also remember, symmetric starts with an S, switches starts with an S. So the one that switches the letter the order is symmetric. Now here's what it would look like in terms of an angle. Alright. Transitive property. Um, write this. Transitive property. Oh, come on. Um, I want you to just write, for example, hair color, and I'll tell you what I mean in a minute. For example, hair, hair color. Alright, here's what I mean by hair color. Um, Let's see. It's not helpful. All right. I'll try this. Okay. So, never mind. I hope y'all are looking, listening, and thinking. All right. If I have the same hair color as Jaston, and Jaston has the same hair color as McKenna, what could you say about me and McKenna? Good. Some people are probably still processing my question. So let me ask it again. <laughs> if I have the same hair color as Justin, and Justin has the same hair color as McKenna, what can be said about me and McKenna? Same hair color. We also have the same hair color. That's the transitive property. It's where you're saying, hey, if one equals two, follow this. I'm not talking about value, I'm talking about like angle numbers. If angle one equals angle two, and angle two equals angle three, then angle one, then angle one has to also equal angle three. 
It's like you're transferring the congruence from the one to the three by the fact that they're both equal to the, the middle one, okay? So that's what I mean by hair color. So here's what it looks like if we're talking about segments. And it's a little confusing because you have so many letters, but if you know AB is equal to CD, and then you know CD is equal to EF, so you're talking about three segments here, then you could come back and say the first one must equal the last one, and it's because of the transitive property. Here's what it looks like with angles. It's a little bit easier because you don't have as many letters. Brain, stay awake. Don't have as many letters here. And then now what I want to do is give you a visual, okay? Um, so I'm going to come down here underneath the transitive box and I'm going to draw a diluted version of a train. Everybody knows what a train looks like. So if car A, right, is pulling, connected, here's my way of showing connected, to car B, and car B is pulling or connected to car C, then can we also say that A is pulling C? Yeah. yeah. So think of it as a train effect. Like if one equals two and two equals three, then you can say, okay, so one also equals three. So I want you to think train to remind you of how the cars pull. Like the lead car is essentially pulling every car behind it, even though it's only directly connected to the next car, right? Now, if your mind doesn't understand what we've all just talked about, that's okay because we actually haven't even put it into practice yet. We still have some more to talk about on the back. You're welcome, in Maui's voice, for copying what needs to be written on the back because as you can see, it is a lot and I did not want to sit here and wait for you to copy everything down. I wanted to be able to talk about it immediately and move to the practice. But we still have to look at it. So go to the back. Vertical angles. Angles that are across from each other where two lines intersect. You should already be familiar with vertical angles, right? Okay, so anytime two lines cross, you have vertical angles that are congruent. You have another pair not even marked here, right? That would be the top and the bottom. What I want you to do is... So if you look next to the vocab word, you'll see where I put the picture there for you. So just anytime you need to mark vertical angles, what's your reason? Vertical angles. Okay. All right, go to linear pair. Linear pair, angles that form a straight line. If you look at this, I've already written on your paper this picture. Dear Lord, is this going on? Hold, hold down the button and turn hey, who, it off. What is it? It's a snapshot. Guys, it's on airplane mode, so how is it still? Do, do not disturb. It's on airplane mode. I got it. I'm on do not disturb. Hello, please come over to my house right now, my parents. Okay. okay, back to this. I've lost you. So this is the definition of linear pair is when you have two or more angles that form a straight line. Okay, imagine it as little tiles that come together and then they form that straight line. Look at the next one. Linear pair postulate. Do not let the word postulate <coughs> 
confuse you. Postulate. Postulate is a fancy word for a statement in math that gets used. Um, it can be proven, but it's kind of like it's one of your little tools of evidence. Okay, imagine like you're a lawyer, you have a briefcase, you have all these pieces of evidence: addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, substitution, um, reflexive, symmetric, transitive. So far, all of that's in your briefcase, right? Now we've thrown in vertical angles, we've thrown in linear pair, now we're throwing in linear pair postulate. Look at the definition on your paper where I wrote linear pair, then I wrote linear pair postulate. Look at your paper. Look at your paper. Look at the difference between linear pair and the postulate. What's the difference? Uh, one's an equation. Definitions. Uh, the definition for linear pair, then the definition for linear pair postulate. Well, they're completely different. They're totally different. <laughs> what does linear pair postulate talk about that is not discussed in the regular definition? Thank you. In the postulate, it brings up the fact that the angles are supplementary. That has a number tied to it. What number is tied to the word supplementary? 180. 180. In the definition, is there a number discussed at all? No, it just says when angles come together to form a straight line. So in the definition, it's just saying, hey, they formed a straight line. But then the very next example is saying, by the way, that straight line measures 180. See the difference? Okay, so the definition is just saying, here, I have a straight line. The postulate is saying, hey, they add up to 180. You with me? Okay. Look at the next one. You've got corresponding angles postulate, then you've got corresponding angles converse. Let me explain the two. Look at the postulate. Read the definition. Given that parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then pairs of corresponding angles are congruent. Parallel lines cut by transversal, corresponding angles are congruent. Let me refresh you on corresponding angles. You have parallel lines. Right, that was bad. Parallel lines cut by transversal. Corresponding angles are ones that are in the same position. Right? So for instance, in this case, left of the parallel line underneath the transversal. Left of the parallel line underneath the transversal. There's another pair. There's multiple pairs. There's this pair. There's, switch it up, there's this pair. And then there's this pair. You see it? Those are all corresponding angles. Okay, the corresponding angles postulate says, hey, if you know you've got parallel lines, then you can say that the green angle is equal to the green angle because they're corresponding angles. All right, let's go to the next one. Corresponding angles converse. Okay, listen to me. If I come in the door after the bell rings, then I'm tardy. Right? That's called a conditional statement. I hope you're listening. Statement is, if, the condition is, if I come in the door after the bell rings, the consequence is, then I am tardy. tardy. Now listen to the sentence I'm going to say. If I'm tardy, then I came in after the bell rang. What did I do? You just flipped it. I switched it. Is it still true? Yeah. Yeah. Right? So the condition now is, if I was marked tardy, the consequence, or the, the action from that, was because I came in the door after the bell rang. Right. So what I want you to do is to look at these two. You've got corresponding angles postulate. Then you have corresponding angles converse. 
right? In the postulate, it says if parallel lines are cut by a transversal, then corresponding angles are congruent. All right, so let's abbreviate. If lines are parallel, then you can say some angles are congruent. So the converse means to do what? <coughs> Switch it. So if you have congruent angles, then you can say lines are parallel. So look what I did here. I took this and I switched it to here, and I took that, and I switched it to there. Look at the difference. How are you going to know when to use the postulate and when to use the converse? Here's how you know. It's based on, come on, it's based on the if part, what you know, what you start with. If you have parallel lines to start with, and you're fixing to discuss congruent angles, then it's the postulate. If you have congruent angles, then you're going to discuss parallel lines, it's the converse. Here's how I remember it. What does postulate start with? What does the word parallel start with? Postulate starts with P, parallel starts with P. What does congruence start with? What does converse start with? So the way that I memorize it is whatever I've already discussed, what does it start with? And then that tells me which one I'm fixing to use. If I've already discussed parallel lines, I'm using the postulate. If I've already discussed angles being congruent, I'm using the converse. Okay? Then the last one, uh, angle angle similarity postulate, that will come up after spring break. We'll come back to that. Okay. Um, go to the middle of the paper where there is a two column proof provided for you. It is already filled in. Oh, and it's missing. All right, so let's read through it. When you start a two column proof, okay? You always start with your statements and reasons. Alright, so we have a we have a statement column where you're making a statement like in the courtroom. Then we have a reason column and this is where you are supplying the proof. Okay? So statements and reasons, two columns drew that a little big, now I can't draw the picture of it, so I'll come over here and draw the picture. No, I don't like it. Alright, hold on. Let me bring all this down. Uh -oh. Wait, what two column proofs, okay? So remember what I said that this is one of the hardest lessons and while um, while it's still challenging, I've figured out ways to try to show you patterns that come up and then hopefully if you can't learn how to do proofs you can at least learn how to recognize the patterns and still be successful. Um, so when you have a two column proof all right, which is the only type of proof we're going to do. We're not doing the paragraph proof like you see at the bottom. Your statements are going to come from where you're actually working with the picture, okay, or the map. Your reasons are going to come from the front of this sheet or the top of it where we just talked about some things, and 
that's where you're justifying every move. You should know that every single proof starts with a statement that you already know, you with me, and a reason that you were given, okay? Every proof starts with something from the picture that they tell you to start with or that's marked in the picture, and the reason is always given. You gotta start somewhere, right? We don't start from a blank page. So in this particular case, it says, in the diagram below, line M intersects line N, and it tells us to prove that angles one and three are congruent. So right here, we would say lines M and N intersect. What's our reason? Because they told me it did, right? Given, you with me? All right, look at the next one. It says angle one and two are a, I'm gonna abbreviate linear pair with LP because I'm running out of the room. Angle one and two are a linear pair and angle two and three are a linear pair. All right, look at the picture. One and two are right here. You agree? No. Okay. Two and three are right here. Do you agree? Do you see that they are both linear pairs? One and two is a linear pair, two and three is a linear pair? Now, what's your reason? Well, if you just call something out as a vocab word, you with me? I just called them a vocab word. Then your reason is, okay, definition of linear pair. I just said, hey, by the way, these things in the picture are a vocab word, then its reason is by definition of that vocab word. All right, if you know angles are a linear pair, that means you also know that they do what? What's the number associated with that? Thank you. I'm going to ask it again. If you know some angles are a linear pair, What's the number tied to that? Okay, so the very next line says, all right, so angle one plus angle two must be 180, and angle two plus angle three must be 180. Why? Because they're linear pairs. I got hiccups. Go back to, go to the top of your paper. Linear pairs are something linear. Pairs. What's what's the fancy thing though? Postulate. It would be linear pair postulate. Postulate. Okay, look, here is a pattern in proofs. Here's a pattern. If you talk about some angles being a linear pair, and you say by definition of linear pair, the very next line is going to say, hey, by the way, they add to 180 because of the linear pair postulate. This is a pattern right here in your proofs. The pattern is you have to first call them out as a linear pair by the definition then the very next line is to say, hey, they add up to 180 by the postulate, okay? Y'all with me? Yeah. That's a pattern. This is never in the reverse order, ever. All right, and then, so right here, do you notice how this says 1 plus 2 equals 180 and 2 plus 3 equals 180? Yep. Do you notice that? Mm -hmm. So do you notice how they both equal 180? So, if 1 plus 2 is 180 and 2 plus 3 is 180, is it fair to say that 1 plus 2 must equal 2 plus 3? Yeah. And that was by substitution. Now, the very next line I put 4.5 because sometimes people jump straight to the next one. And then sometimes people say, wait a minute, you've got to do the whole property of equality. Um, I personally, I don't care either way, which way you go, so we'll just jump to the next one. Notice right here, 1 
plus 2 equals 2 plus 3. What do you notice they both have? So if I subtracted angle 2, whatever angle 2 measures, if I just subtracted it away from both sides, it would disappear, right? Because it's on both sides. And I would be left with that angle 1 is equal to angle 3. And what were the, what were the directions from the beginning? Prove that angle 1 equals angle 3. So we would say, what did you do here? We subtracted. Okay. Listen, I know this is not at all anyone's favorite lesson. Your homework, your practice tonight is instead of diving into you filling it in from blank or from a word bank, we're going to do a, a scramble. This is a scramble. It's only one side. So the answers are here, but they're in the wrong order. You have to rearrange them, okay? With me? This is 56. I want to see what you get tomorrow when you do this. I'll do it. Y'all need to do it too, boys. I'm sitting. Y'all come to school with it. Your homework done.